and uh, at this time I'd like to introduce John Nelson, who is the friend of Cal Feden, and he will in turn uh, introduce Dr. Rush Duty to you. About 12 years ago, I was an elder in an organization which eventually became the Evangelical Orthodox Church, uh, working through church renewal and all that. And one day, talking to my bishop, he told me there's a little book that's creating quite a stir out here on the West Coast. Uh, some of the bishops would like some of the elders to read this thing and review it and get their input back. They asked me if I would uh, be willing to read the thing and review it to the bishops, and I said, why, why sure. So he sent the book, and it was a little book, God's Plan for Victory, by Gustav John Rushton. And I'd never heard of the man before, um, didn't know him from Adam, but I read the book, and it was literally like a, a hammer between the eyes. I said, I don't know who this man is, but this is the truth. And I'm sure that almost everyone here, not everyone, could relate to uh, minor differences of that nation. God has used us and Elsie to cut across the entire spectrum, spectrum of American and even global Christianity to begin turning the church around. Friends of Chelsea was just a loose coalition of Friends of Cal Stevens that uh, has as its aim to make us, people who understand or hear what Mark and Cal Stevens say, to become more aware of what Cal Stevens does, the extent of his ministry, uh, the scope of his message, and on a more personal level, to make us aware of each other. There are obviously Presbyterians here, there are here, who know. We have common ground in Christ through the ministry of Chalcedon. Mark is going to speak to us this afternoon about the necessity for Christian education, short speech, and then we're going to throw the floor open to whatever questions you may have on your mind. You direct them up to us and you'll field them at his discretion and answer them for you. At 3 o'clock, we want to take a break. We want to knock off about uh, 15 minutes, give a glass of something or other, and give Mark a chance to rest, rest his voice. Also, on the back table near the door is a plate, a little sign, uh, for the purpose of your contributions toward the work of Chelsea you know, to help you pray the cross that's get together. So uh, feel free to uh, contribute back there. No one place it, it's half a place. It's entirely up to you. So without any more ado, let's go. I'm going to sit because I've been quite sick this week, which is not a common experience for me, and I resent it. I don't like being sick. But I have been sick, and I wasn't able to talk until Thursday, and I'm still taking penicillin to try to throw off this infection I've got. I have lost my voice totally. So you'll bear with me if I have a problem sometimes. I want to read just a verse from Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter. In the first verse, we are told, This is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Then in the 10th verse, he says of Levi, Thou shalt teach Jacob thy judgments, and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before the end, whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. Now, the Levites are called upon to be the teachers of Israel. The ministry today is Levitical. It is not 
Aaronic. The priest of Aaron ended when the temple was destroyed. So, the Christian ministry from the time of the apostles has been Levitical. They called themselves Levites. The first term used for the church what was not ecclesia but synagogue. In the letter of James, where you read assembly in the English, the word in the Greek is synagogue. Synagogue. What does this tell us? Well, before that, our Lord called out twelve disciples, one for each tribe of Israel. What he was saying was, the old Israel is finished. It's apostate. I'm creating a new Israel of God, a new chosen people. I'm creating them out of every tribe, tongue, tongue and nation. Now, of course, the old Israel was far international than we realize. I won't go into that. But, what was the nature to be? Well, at the time of our Lord, Israel, or Judea, had changed drastically. Power had been centralized in Jerusalem. The area known as Galilee was where the ten northern tribes were. They paid no attention to the temple. Shortly before the time of our Lord, the Pharisees sent missionaries up into Galilee. And all the Galileans professed to believe in God and in the Word of God. But none of them would listen to the Pharisees who had been sent to them. This is why they said of our Lord, Can any good thing come out of Galilee? They hated them. What had happened? Well, there are, in the whole of the Pentateuch, 613 laws given. A lot of those laws man has no right to enforce. Only God can enforce them. God requires tithing, for example. He tells us what will happen to a people that will not tithe. Malachi is very clear. But he never gives the church or the temple or any agency to enforce the tithe. Most of those 613 laws are enforceable by God alone. That does not mean much government left to man. A high percentage of the remaining laws, which are enforceable by men, are enforceable by the family, by parents. In fact, the basic control of society is given by God not to the state but to the family. Consider the basic problem or uh, the basic powers in any society. Control of children. If you control children, you control the future. That's why you have public schools. The public schools began in Prussia, 
with Prussian autocracy as a means of control. So the first and basic power in any society is control of children. God gives that to you as parents to none other. We're taking back that power. Christian and homeschool movement now controls 40% of the children of the United States. I hope by the end of this decade we will be over 50%. Then we can tell the public schools, mind your own business, you're a dying institution and we're not going to pay any attention to you. The second basic power in any society is control of property. And in the Bible, that's given to the family. Not the current family, but to the generations where it's a rural property. Remember Naboth? What he told King Ahab? This is not my land to sell. It was given to me by my forefathers, and it is as an inheritance for my children's children. I'm the steward, not the owner. The family is the owner of property. That's the second great power in any society. And through taxation and other means, debt, that power has passed out of the family's hands, into the bank's hands, the federal government's hands, the state's hands with taxation. People are beginning to take back that power by observing God's laws of debt, no debt beyond six years. And if enough of us do, it's going to shake this country to its foundation. Now, the third great power in any society is inheritance. And we are told by Solomon that a godly man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. We didn't come into this world as an empty world, and we should not leave it more empty when we leave. It's a Christian power. We are to enrich the godly seed, to pass over those who are ungodly and disinherit them, and bless godly children. fourth great power in any society is education. We're taking that back. It's a power given to the Levites. They shall teach us Jacob thy judgments in Israel, thy law. We have to teach the whole word of God to our children and homeschooling. Of Christian schools and in the church. The fifth great power is welfare. And what are we told by Paul? He that doth not take care of his own, especially those of his own house, hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, worse, because he's blasphemed the name of the Lord by calling himself a Christian. So, he that doth not take care of his own, fellow believers, and especially his own household, his relatives, his parents, has denied the faith is worse than an infidel. Now, this 
was 